Good morning and welcome. Uh, this morning we are in Psalm chapter 11, going through Psalms at a breakneck pace. Well, maybe not a breakneck, but uh, definitely not a snail's pace. Maybe it's a leisurely stroll through the Psalms, I guess, maybe. <laughs> uh, but Psalms chapter 11, let's read it together before we pray to God for understanding. To the choir master of David, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow, they have fitted their arrow to the string, and shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we rely upon you, Lord. We proclaim that our trust and our foundation is in you. Lord, we ask this morning for our daily bread. We ask, Lord, that you would speak through your holy word, that you would cause your word to come alive in our lives. Lord, that we may see you clearer, that we may love you better, that we may serve you faithfully. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalms chapter 11 is, is an interesting psalm because it's the first psalm that we look at that is not a prayer. There's no prayer in here. There's no petition it's, it's actually just declaration. David is declaring truth. As we read through the psalm, we see what David is going through. We don't exactly know, like, kind of what situation arose for David to write the psalm. Uh, maybe it's, you know, fleeing from Saul before he becomes king. Uh, or maybe it's some of the other... Uh, struggles that he has after he becomes king, we don't know. But we are told a little bit about what he faces and what he declares out of that situation. And as we read through it, we see the common thread is sight. Sight. That there are things that David does not know and cannot see. And these things are frightening and terrifying and dangerous. And in face of those things, David proclaims truth. David proclaims truth of other things that he cannot see, but things that he knows to be true and that are comforting. So let's take out the take a look at the first section, which is one, verses 1 to 3. And here we see the unseen that David fears, or that is dangerous, that is attacking David. All right, so verse 2 says, Behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. Now, this sounds kind of like a lot of the other struggles that David has been through, but here it introduces something different, darkness. That these arrows are coming out of the dark. And if arrows are coming out of the dark, they are very hard to defend against. You know, when you see in the movies, you know, they're, they're shooting arrows. You can, you know, you get the nice cinematic shot of the arrow coming down out of the sky. Uh, 
And, but when you see the arrow, you can block it with a shield. You can dodge it. You can, you know, run away from it. But here, David says the struggle he's facing is that of an unknown assailant. The arrow is being shot in the dark. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, his, he's facing stormtroopers who, you know, just can't shoot for their life. And it's like he's in the dark and, you know, he's safe. It's quite the opposite. It's that these arrows are coming from a point unknown, from a person that he can't see. It's like the old, maybe ancient version of facing a sniper. There is trouble that he can't see. There's something that he can't put his hand on. He doesn't know who's attacking. He doesn't know where he's attacking from. He knows that he is being, he is under attack. But it is an unknown attack, the most fearful, stress-inducing kind of attack. Many people feel this kind of stress today, even if it's not a bow and arrow, but, you know, stress from unseen assailants, unseen dangers. Things that you can't prevent, things that you can't ward off, things that you can't avoid. And it seems like there's nothing you can do about it except be fearful about these attacks. Whether it's, you know, losing your job or, uh, you know, um, you know, other things, losing, losing social, uh, social standing or losing friends or, uh, you know, those things that you just are out of your control. Those things that you can't even see happening, you can't see coming. These are, are some of the most stressful kind of attacks. These are attacks that seem to threaten our very foundation. These are attacks that seem to make everything shaky. And we see a lot of the unrest happening in this country is happening because of these kind of stresses, these kind of trials, these kind of uh, attacks. Things coming from places unseen that seem to shake your very foundation. And in this kind of situation, David receives this advice. Verse 1. Flee like a bird to your mountain. This is very logical, very natural advice. And it's, it makes tons of sense. Right? If there are things coming at you, if, if your foundations, if everything you've rested on so far seems to be shaking and moving and unsure, well... You know, the most logical step is to find something that is secure. Find something else that is stronger. Find some other strength. And usually this is natural, worldly strength. This is why as the pandemic, you know, started to rage, there was an increase of not only uh, people buying the toilet paper, uh, but also people buying guns. Why? The foundation is shaking. And our natural inclination is to find strength. And so David is being told, flee like a bird to your mountain. It's not talking about physical locations. Uh, it's talking about spiritual realities. Find a secure place, find strength. Find some place where your feet can stand and it doesn't feel like you're going to stumble. But David declares this in the first, in the very first verse, the first sentence, in the Lord I take refuge. 
He's already stated his foundation. This is what I'm standing on. I'm standing on the Lord. And now I'm facing these unseen attacks, these unavoidable situations, these unblockable uh, tribulations. And it feels like my foundation is going to give out at any moment. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever encountered something that was, you know, just so bad that it just felt like even though you're, you're standing on God and even though you're standing on Christ, the solid rock as we sing in the hymns, it still feels like it's shaking. It still feels like the foundations could give way. This is what David's going through. This is what this psalm is talking about. Here is this, this situation where David feels his foundation rocking, even though his foundation is the Lord. And the counsel of the world is saying, go seek a stronger strength. Go find a safer refuge. But David says, how can you say to my soul? That is, your advice is not correct. Your advice is worldly advice. And this is not good advice. So from that we see that uh, verses, uh, the end of verse 1 to 2 and to 3, these are all David listing the bad advice that he's getting. In this unknown situation, David says, we should not find a different foundation. What should we do in the face of unseen, the unseen that endangers us, the unseen that attacks us, the unseen that seems to shake the very foundations we stand on? David proclaims the unseen that he knows, starting in verse 4. It's very helpful to, to have beliefs that you know, even though you can't see them. Because when your life gets shaken up so much, these are the things you're going to stand on. These are the things that you are going to put your strength in because you know they are true even though you can't see them and even though your whole world seems to be shaking. Uh, back at our previous church, um, you know, at the at the end, the the leaders called me together and you know they they decided to you know let me go. Uh, for you know really no good reason whatsoever and just totally out of the blue and i remember at that meeting like just hearing the hearing the news and i was just crushed inside and I, like my whole world my whole foundations had just gone and i was just reeling from from this news and and all I could say in the meeting was, you know, thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, some other things like that. I don't even remember what I said. Uh, but I remember as the weeks went on, as the dust started to clear, like the, the leaders realized, man, this, this, maybe they made a mistake or, you know, maybe the way they handled it wasn't the best and they realized how hurt I really was. And, and they're like, well, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you, you know, why didn't you object? Why didn't you, you know, say this is wrong and, and how you're hurt? And all I said was like, you know, this news settled me, settled on me with like a ton of bricks. And like, I just, I just couldn't think of anything 
except for what I know. Uh, and that truth of what I knew was the only thing that came out. And that truth is, I love the church like my family, even though it hurts me. And even though it may stab me in the back, I still love the people in it. And David here is doing the same thing. All right, he's feeling his foundation shaken, but he speaks to the truth that he knows, even though it's unseen. And that truth is the center of this psalm, verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. Again, we're not talking about location. We're talking about spiritual reality, spiritual truth. What is this truth that David is standing on? The Lord is in his holy temple. He's not giving a GPS location for God saying, well, if I need to find God, I know where to go. What David is saying is, I know God is still in control. I know that God is still ruling and reigning. He's in his holy temple. He is on his throne. He has not been displaced. He's not absent. He hasn't been kidnapped. He hasn't gone on vacation. The Lord is on his throne. He is in control. He is in charge. And even though it may seem like my foundations are shaking, I know God is in control. This is, this is deep and this is, this is kind of the way that Psalms that David uh, says other truths like, uh, you know, like the prophets, uh, you know, I, ha I, have, I have a plan for you, a plan for you to prosper. That's, that's David saying the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. He's in control. He's in charge. Or it's the same way as in the New Testament, Paul says, all things work for good. for Those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's exactly what David's saying. The Lord is in his holy temple. God, his throne is in heaven. God is seated on his throne and he looks down on everything and everything is as God desires it to be. Right? The world has not run away out of God's control. The harness of the world has not slipped from his fingers. God is still sovereign. This is what David knows in his heart of hearts. It's what he knows from experience with God. It's what he knows from God's word. It's what he knows from God's, his relationship with God. This is what he knows, and this is what he can stand on even when everything else seems uncertain. And because God is on his throne, because God is in control, David can make this statement, his eyes see. We've been talking about things that are unseen, things that are unseen and terrifying, things that are unseen and dangerous. Those are those things that are unseen and, and stressful. But David says, God sees. My enemies might be you know, trying to shoot me with arrows from the, in the dark. But God can see. God can see everything. So in the eyes of God, the unseen are seen. What does he see? His eyelids test the children of man. Verse, four, verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous 
but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. But God sees. God sees us. He sees you. You are seen by God the Almighty. And what does that mean? Well, usually when we, when we say, you know, nowadays, I feel seen, that means I feel validated, I feel vindicated, I feel like I'm not alone. I feel like someone else, you know, can see my situation. That is true. God sees our situation. But it also says the Lord tests the righteous. And it's not just he gives us a quiz, you know, he doesn't just hand us a scantron. This is used of uh, metalworking. When the blacksmith or the metalsmith is working on metal, he tests the metal. That is, he needs to see its composition. How pure is it? How hard is it? How useful is it? And this is what the Lord does for us. He sees what we're made of. You know, not to condemn us, not to put us down. Oh, how useless he is. Oh, how full of flaws she is. No. But what a metal worker does when, when they fully examine and test a piece of metal is that they, now they can work to get the impurities out. They can work the metal to make it useful. They can work the metal to make it better. And that's what the Lord does to us. He sees us. And then he can bring us through those times of trials and tribulations and refine us. He can bang out those things that are impure, those things that are not right, those things that are not pleasing to him. He can work that out of us and shape us into what he desires us to be. He sees us. But he also sees the wicked. And his, his application for seeing the wicked is a very strong word. The Lord hates the wicked. Now, usually in the church, we, we love to say, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. Which is, there's, there's, good, there's good theology behind it in that we love people no matter what they do. But there's also the truth that we can't completely separate who we are from what we've done. And the Lord is so righteous that he hates all wickedness. He cannot stand for any injustice. That's why last week we looked at a previous psalm that said God is angry all the time at unrighteousness. All the time. He doesn't take a break from, from being mad at injustice. And so God always hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Of course, the great news of the gospel is that even though we do wickedness and even though we do kind of love violence in a way, uh, we can be made righteous because of what Christ has done for us. And so when the judgment comes, we do not need to be in the camp of the wicked. His soul does not hate us because our Wickedness is put on the, the shoulders of Jesus. And on the cross, God the Father looked at God the Son bearing the sin of the world and he hated it. And he turned his face away from Jesus and Jesus said, Why have you forsaken me? Because God hates all wickedness. And so when Jesus was punished for our behalf, he was put to death and that wickedness, that sin that was on his shoulder was paid for by his death. And because of that, God the Father exalts Jesus Christ above 
every name. And we too now can join the ranks of the righteous. And so our test by the Lord, his seeing us is not a bad thing, but it's a good thing. He sees us. He tests us. He refines us. So David faces the unseen attack, the unseen that he fears, but then proclaims the unseen that he knows. And then lastly, in verses 6 and 7, he declares the unseen that will be seen. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be their portion of their cup. He knows there's going to be judgment. And this knowledge, even though it's unseen and even though it hasn't happened yet, will come to pass. It will become seen. And also the judgment for the righteous. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Do you see that switch? It's, it's been talking all along from David's vantage point of things he can't see. He can't see the attack. He can't see the fears that are coming. He also can't see those things that he knows. The Lord is on his holy temple. He knows it, but he can't see it. Verse 7 turns it around. He knows at the end that when the Lord judges, the upright shall behold his face. That what we cannot see will turn into what we can see. This is the promise that David has in the Lord as the promise that we have in Christ that what is unseen will turn to be seen in the words of the psalm in the words of the hymn sorry uh, it is well with my soul the last verse is o lord haste the day when the faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall appear. Faith be made sight. We live now by faith. We live now declaring that which we cannot see. Facing fears that we cannot see. But we know that faith will turn to sight. That that which we hope for, which we long for, will 100% take place. And that we will be vindicated. It will, at some point in time, no longer be simply a hope or a vision, or a firm belief, it will be sight, it will be fact, it will be what we can see with our eyes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you, you know that we, we undergo fears that that shake us, Lord. We face things that we can't see, that we can't understand, that we can't predict, that we can't avoid. Lord, so we pray that like David, we would root ourselves on your promises those things that you have promised us that we know to be true even though we don't see them. 
to stand by faith on your foundation. Not to search for another source of strength, not to search, search for another foundation, but to stand on the foundation that is you, that is Christ, and to proclaim our faith, that we know these things to be true, that God, you are in control. You are on your throne and you rule and you reign. And what is happening to us and to this world is not out of your control. And we pray with the hymn writer, O oh Lord, do haste the day when the faith becomes sight. When the wicked are judged and the righteous see your face. Until then, we cry, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We stand by faith upon that which we cannot see, but we know it to be true. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.